what I want to talk about today is just to give you a, a quick introduction to the port because I've been here now for five years and uh, I keep meeting people who, who don't know what happens down here at the port. I want to look at the, the past and present. Then quickly about the port archive and then as Joe was saying, look at the decade of commemorations. We've had a series of projects, my colleagues Martin, Joe, or Jim and myself, uh, looking at the decade of commemorations from a perspective uh, of the Dublin Port Company, which has been around for 300 years. And then to finish up and just talk about some of the plans that we have uh, looking into the future uh, for port city integration and, and, and the role of the port and, and the city. Um, the port itself has been around for a long time. It uh, dates itself back to 1707, originally as, as a, a subcommittee of uh, Dublin Corporation. Um, has changed its title. Uh, my parents would always call it the Dublin Port and Docks Board. But since 1997, it's been known as uh, Dublin Port Company, uh, a landlord port. So it operates the, the estate, as we call it, as a, as a landlord would. And then you have a series of tenants who operate in it and as a commercial semi-state. Um, miraculously, we're still reliant on two amazing walls, the North Bull Wall and the South Bull Wall, to remain open. Onto these two walls were built. Uh, Dublin, uh, accessing Dublin was actually very, very difficult. Um, and once the balls, walls were built, it created a natural scoring or scouring effect that creates a, a channel for the port. And that's why it's still here today. Uh, and it's why it's still, it's still operating after 221 years. Um, and very, very important to us. The impact of the, the uh, port company is kind of in the, the areas of brown in this map. Everything that's been filled in by the port company, its predecessors, uh, as the city moved eastwards from 1720. Um, so this is the kind of dramatic impact uh, of a, a small company on the city itself. It's also the reason there are so many few bridges. Uh, the port company was responsible for all bu bridge building up as far as Houston Station, and naturally was reluctant to build bridges because they cost money. Um, meanwhile, the, the uh, county council or the city council wanted the port to build the bridges, and that's why there's been more bridges built in the last 30 years that were built in the previous 110. Coming from our port collections, this is what the custom house area used to look like. Uh, you can see how busy it was in around, around there. The early steamship there, but also a huge amount of uh, sailing ships. And then Halpin's Pool is an area uh, just um, east of uh, where the Three Arena is today. Uh, an area, again, a busy place with uh, trawlers, but also uh, early steamships going off to the UK uh, in the uh, 1820s and 1830s. Today, there are now four competing roll-on, uh, roll roll-off lines or ferry lines. You've got Stena, P&O, Sea Truck, and Irish Ferries going to Liverpool and to uh, Hollyhead in Wales. Um, we also have uh, three competing uh, lift-on or low-low terms, lift-on uh, terminals uh, competing against each other. And this is where the competition is uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the port, importing and uh, exporting off the island. The big change in the port since I've come here has been containers of row, on row row direct to Europe, to Zeebrugge and to uh, Rotterdam on the CLDN uh, ships. And in particular, there are very large ships, um, the Selene, which uh, takes eight kilometers of uh, trailers and containers on board. So this is the big change that's occurred. Drivers no longer travel uh, uh, as much as they used to on the, uh, the ferries. Uh, and since Brexit, we're now seeing this is the growth area, about 50% of all trade from the, the port is now going direct to Europe. Uh, prior to Brexit, it would be about a third. Uh, and again, you'll see various figures, but roughly 80% of all row road traffic in Ireland comes through, uh, through Dublin. And this is what the port looks like today, um, mainly on the north side, but also shared lands on the south side of the ESB, Irish Water, and uh, the uh, incinerator. And this kind of gives you an aerial, and you can also see from this image in particular how important the impact of the two uh, walls in keeping the bars the sandbars on either side off the channel uh, and keeping them open. Naturally, the area that we now associate with Google and with law firms and accountancy firms is the Docklands area has changed over the last uh, 30 years. The introduction of more bridges, again, all built by Dublin Corporation. This is what the area looked like in 1986 when a survey was carried out. All this area was actually owned by the port company until handed over to the Docklands Development Board in the late 1980s. This is where the Harbour Master Pub is uh, in the centre of uh, the Docklands area, a different view from the 1980s, and you can kind of see the decay and neglect. This is a view looking from Bosaurus as you look uh, to the south of the city over the Matt Tolbert Bridge, an area that you wouldn't recognise today uh, with a huge number of offices that replace the large car parks and, and the warehousing. CHQ would be the last kind of big warehouse that's remained. All the other warehousing that was in the area has been knocked down. And then looking from uh, Ring's End, again, up the river, just as the East Link Bridge opened in the early 1980s, again, you see a city that you wouldn't recognize uh, today, which has kind of dramatically changed. With the Port Archive, then, we're very, very lucky that the collection actually has survived. Um, like ourselves in Guinnesses, um, the archives uh, are there. We have uh, a 
about 30,000 engineering drawings. Uh, we now have 78,000 photographs. Um, we have 60 historical charts uh, going back as far as 1620. Uh, and then we also have the kind of bureaucracy, if you like, all the files and documents that you associate with a big organization. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have that and that they actually have survived. As Liz talked uh, in her lecture, you're reminded of the destruction of the, uh, the records in the four courts. Uh, and that's had a huge impact on what we know as historians about uh, our city, but also about our country. Um, so we are lucky that there are commercial collections that have survived. And again, we're very, very lucky to my predecessors and our predecessors who have actually maintained this material um, because there was no legislation to protect any of it until the early uh, 1990s. So in many ways, we're very, very indebted to many retired members of staff who over the years looked after this wonderful uh, archive collection. And from those images, you kind of get the spread of the collection. It is everything uh, and all aspects uh, of a port. Uh, on our website, which has been redeveloped, you'll find more details, more scanned collections uh, and the events and copies of uh, our talks and lectures that we've given. Uh, and we also have other uh, uh, websites that you might be interested in talking about the history of the port, Dublin Port Post 2040 dialogue papers, which were prepared by our previous uh, chief executive, kind of detail the history of the port uh, and uh, give a good insight into the complexities, the engineering challenges that are faced in, in operating a big, busy port. So looking back at the decade of commemorations, uh, which is coming to an end uh, late next year, um, in many ways, it's a dramatic impact on Ireland. Uh, the Irish people from 1914 to 23 endured 10 years of intense military activity. Uh, World War I, an urban insurrection, a guerrilla war, and finally a bitter, a very bitter civil war, as Liz has explained. The result was a new nation bearing the, both the hopes of many citizens and the pain left by the wars that brought it into being. And we're looking at huge numbers, 30,000 Irishmen killed fighting for um, uh, the British Army in World War I. You're looking at, in Dublin alone, the death of 350 civilians during 1916. And we now have a fairly comprehensive list of War of Independence deaths of maybe almost 2,000. So again, a huge impact and scar. From a Dublin port perspective, uh, the port is involved with the lockout, as Joe had mentioned. World War I staff were involved in World War I, part of the North Wall extensions taken over by the Royal Navy. An ammunition factory is built in this, where this building is today. Uh, and naturally, there's a War of Independence, uh, which the members of staff are heavily involved in, and the Civil War itself, which I'll talk about. Um, this is an image that you've seen earlier on, which is the map from about 1906 of what the Port Estate looked like. Um, and you kind of can see that it's very much connected to the, to the country, with, especially on the north side, a series of rail yards. You could technically take, uh, 100 years ago, take a, a fast express train from Kerry uh, to come to Dublin on a first class, then transfer onto your first class cabin um, on uh, the North Keys and be in London within 12 hours. Uh, so we talk about today the connectivity, but that connectivity has been there ever since the, uh, the rail network was built in the 1850s and 1860s. This is uh, an image of the North Wall extension, uh, which was controlled uh, by the Royal Navy and the British Army uh, from 1914 to today, uh, 100 years ago when they evacuated. So we have this amazing uh, port register, which is a list of names of employees from 1995, from 1895 to 1925, which we've called the name book. Um, and it kind of gives you an idea of all the people that are employed, including some of their wonderful uh, job descriptions as the scavenger, a scraper, a holder upper, and the lamp man. Uh, names that we really need to kind of do more research on uh, and we're, uh, to find out what they actually were employed on. Um, there's no list of dockers in the port because, again, they're day workers who are or, uh, op uh, hired by stevedoring companies. So the companies um, themselves, and some of their records have survived and uh, they're in UCD archive. But again, large numbers of those details are lost. So we're very, very lucky that this document has survived. Uh, and the book itself is on our website. The reason why this has been very important to us for the decade of commemorations is the HR, the personnel department as it was, went through all those names. And when it came across a staff member who'd served with the British uh, Army, it put a British uh, flag on the, under their name. In this case, Joseph Bunny uh, was a scavenger and had also served as a reservist uh, in, uh, I think, the Royal Navy. Um, later on, um, you then get uh, the tricolour added for those who served in 1916. Of course, Tom Ennis and his brother serving in 1916 as, as, as two staff members later on, playing a big role in the War of Independence and the, and the Civil War. Um, so these are people who have been identified in the book. And then you also have the complex that some people cover both sides just in case. 
Um, Charles James Birchall served uh, mm-hmm. as a reservist, but later on served in the Civil War. And that's the thing about the uh, Free State Army uh, during the Civil War. It, it has a high proportion of ex-members uh, of the, the British Army. Because again, if you're running a, a, a big army and fighting a civil war, you need experienced troops. So in many ways, uh, the documentation that we have represents that complexity uh, of, the, of the Ireland at this time. And also, I suspect, as you went into the 1920s and 30s, from a personnel department point of view, this kind of information in your name book would help you to figure out which people you're going to put on what rota uh, and make sure there's no clashes uh, with, with people. Uh, we know that there were 59 staff members served in the British Army and the Navy during, uh, during the war. Uh, again, a high proportion of reservists in 1914. And we know that four are killed uh, during the war. Um, and again, like a lot of other corporations, uh, county councils uh, and companies around uh, Dublin and, and Ireland, uh, the, co- the Dublin Port and Dock Boards promise staff half pay uh, to employees to encourage them to join up, which is a huge incentive for people with full-time jobs to join up at the time. This, uh, these names here just kind of give you an idea of some of the, the gentlemen. Um, you'll also see that the, many of them are, are also 1913 strikers. Um, so you have the irony that many of them are fired by the company uh, during the, the, the great lockout um, and then are reinstated back in during the summer of 1914, back into the company after being left out in the cold in many ways. Um, and then within a couple of weeks, they're actually being called up as reservists into the, uh, the, the, the British Army. Shipbuilding in the port has always been very, very important. Uh, Webb and Bewley were the first to open a yard, again, in this part of the, uh, the port, uh, the Dublin Dockyard Company is probably the most successful company that was based here from 1901 to 1919. They built the famous Helga, which was a fisheries protection boat built in 1907, uh, and then becomes infamous or famous during the 1916 Rising. Uh, and then the port tug, uh, the Anne Liffey, Liffey, which was also a very famous uh, tug around the port and bay. Vickers Ireland take over the operation of the dockyard then uh, from 1923 through the emergency. And then between... Um, it, 1950 to 1981, you have the Ditfee Lockyard Limited, which built the Irish Fern and Irish Fur for Irish uh, shipping, and the Meath for the BNI, which were again very well known uh, boats right up into the 1980s. As you can see in this photograph, then during World War One, the Dublin Dockyard Company opened a small shell factory employing 300 local women. Um, again, it was built on this site, um, and uh, we would have held. A, uh, in, 19, in 2018, to remind you, we, we held a conference here in this room looking at their role and looking at the role of the, uh, the port um, company uh, and World War I. Uh, and we also put up a plaque up in our maritime garden to remember those uh, women who served there. Again, we don't have a huge amount of details about them. We are looking at some of the photographs that survived. And you can see a shell over here beside Paul. This is a, an 18-pounder shell. Um, the, the brass part is the propellant that caused the explosion. But the ladies would have been building the, uh, making the, the, the black part there, so it's the explosive part, and then they were shipped to England, uh, and uh, ex- explosive was put into it, uh, and then the, the final uh, shell was assembled and then sent off to the, the Western Front. During the War of Independence, um, a Q company is established within the IRA of uh, IRA General HQ to help smuggle guns, uh, which again is a huge importance uh, for the IRA and, and just being a na- an island nation is the big challenge that <clears throat> all accounts of the IRA in the military bureau papers and also the pension papers you come across is the lack of weapons. Um, working again with a very large group of IRA volunteers in, in Liverpool, they smuggle in only 289 handguns, 53 rifles, and again, the ammunition. So you can kind of see how difficult it is to bring, uh, smuggle these weapons in, but they do huge uh, amount during this time to do so. Um, the Auxiliary Division then established a, a Q company also, uh, based in the London Northwestern Railway Hotel, which is uh, still there uh, on the North Keys. Um, it's formed quite late in the War of Independence, but again, it's a response as the British uh, government and authorities are, are building up their resources. They're kind of realizing that they need to stop this smuggling operation that's going on in ports around the country. Um, And again, this would be very much a a Navy unit, Uh, 56% of the members would have been from the Navy. Um, um, But again, we kind of can focus on the guns and uh, the other elements of kind of the violence of the War of Independence. The Docker strike of June 1920 actually had a bigger uh, impact on the War of Independence. It's a strike that broke out in the port, but then spread into the railway network um, and lasted right up into the Christmas of 1920. Um, And the refusal to take weapons and soldiers and trains caused consternation for the uh, British Army throughout this period and really kind of uh, forced them to go onto the roads um, because they couldn't use the railways 
and that became allowed these new flying columns that arrive in the summer of 1920 to start attacking uh, British troops around the roads. So the, in many ways, we can focus on the, the, the bullets and the bombs being smuggled in and the guns, but it's really the Docker strike and the resulting railway strike has a, a bigger part uh, on, the, on the operation. And again, uh, sadly, due to COVID, uh, we, we ran an online uh, series of weekly lectures on the War, War of Independence um, in Dublin Port and in the inner city. Uh, with the uh, East Wall History Group uh, uh, last year, which proved very, very popular online. And you can find those videos again online. The Civil War in the port. Um, on the 1st of May, the Ballast Office, the port's HQ or headquarters were based uh, on Westmoreland Street, um, were taken over along with Kildare Street and the Masonic Hall uh, were occupied with Republicans. The four courts had already been, uh, as Liz explained, occupied in April. Uh, port staff couldn't get into their building. Um, all the books and ledgers, actually a lot of the historical ledgers that we have in our own collections today, were used to block up the, wi uh, the, the windows by the uh, Republicans. Uh, and a, a, an official uh, deputation was sent by the Lord Mayor and then members of the board, including David Barry, who was chair of the board from 1920 to about 1924. Um, and negotiations were ongoing until the building was, uh, was evacuated. And this is a photograph of that evacuation taking place, which is from the National Museum's collections. Um, it's Republicans leaving the ballast office on the 8th of May, uh, 1922. But it kind of gives you an idea, as Liz was explaining, of this tension that's in the city uh, in April and May and June before the, the, the final kind of explosion of the, 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 the Civil War. There's very little else in the archive, but we do know that by the 5th of July, the Free State forces were in the control of Dublin City. Of course, uh, sadly, Calabruga then is killed on, on, and dies on the 7th. But by that stage, it was, it was over uh, in many ways, and uh, the Republicans start to move down southwards, uh, more into the, the area of Munster. Uh, and this is an armoured car, uh, again, leaving Dublin Port with a diving belt, the famous diving belt that we've uh, rebuilt and repurposed as a museum on the South Keys uh, in the background. So again, the port is essential uh, for sending ships down to Cork, and it's the use of uh, the ships in particular, uh, what's now called combined operations, it's the, taking the armies, taking the shipping, and by going down to Cork, it speeds up uh, in many ways uh, the... Um, the end of the first part of the war. So we, we talk about the summer of 1922 as that initial fight between the two sides, but very much the Free State winning by the time you get into September, and then Republicans, the anti-treaty forces, falling back on what the techniques they'd used during the War of Independence, which is guerrilla warfare. And we see a, a series of a kind of a guerrilla campaign, which carries on in many ways until uh, April of 1923. But again, you can see the advantages that the Free State forces have. They have the artillery and the 18-pounders, they have 18-pounders, 18 and they have 13 of these armoured cars and uh, about 50 uh, Lancia armoured trucks. And that gives them a chance of having excellent uh, firepower, but also mobility. And that's really what the Republicans were up against. Was, as Liz explained, once the importation of weapons and they weren't able to bring in the weapons and they didn't have their own artillery, that they attempted to bring artillery in from Germany, it meant the advantage was always with the government forces. So when it came to, to kind of a projects that we kind of ran, we had uh, the Book of Names, which we ran last year, which looked at that uh, uh, um, company Q and their operations in the port uh, in 1920 and 1921 and the events uh, of that. And then this year we had a, a, a play with Fishamble uh, called Outrage, which again looked at the Civil War and the impact of the Civil War on the port, which uh, again proved very, very popular in our new pump house uh, area. So throughout the kind of decade of commemorations, we very much have uh, it may try to have these seminars, but also then to have uh, theatre events to kind of tie in with them. And today, again, we have uh, the, the 17th of December 1922, the British Army and government finally leave Ireland. Um, on the right-hand side there, you can see a, um, a document from our collections, which is over here, uh, which uh, lists all the uh, overtime rates for the, um, the, the, the crane men. Um, so it was the extra money that they were getting to help in the evacuation of the, uh, the British Army. So uh, it's uh, nice to have that memento from uh, that period from uh, 100 years ago in the room today. When we look at uh, our final kind of port city integration projects and what we're planning to do, this is kind of the vision that the port has uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, and uh, this is our map of our um, master plan. Um, so what the master plan is setting out is to, is to prove capacity, um, the days of expansion of stop, but it's to prove the capacity and to, to improve uh, port city integration, which uh, we're, we're all involved in. Um, we have a series of cycle whales under development. We have the, the Talca Estuary Greenway, which is along the northern fringes. At the moment, the planning permission, or looking for planning permissions, Liffey Talca Pedestrian Cycle Route along the East Wall Road. And then we're creating a pedestrian cycle network 
Um, and then on the south side, we also have a, a 3FM project, which will uh, bring about five kilometres of extra uh, greenway space into uh, the south part of the port, which you can see here. I mentioned already the diving bell, which has proved a hugely popular uh, museum. It's uh, been uh, used by the port since uh, 1860, helped build all the key walls along the port and rebuild many more. Um, and now as a, underneath, you'll find a, a beautiful little museum explaining all that history. And it gets about 80 to 100,000 people a year popping in to have a view and, and to see and learn more about uh, how the whole uh, Dockland area in many ways was built. Uh, in 2017, then Port Centre, the Maritime Garden opened. This is the first uh, stab at breaking down that kind of barrier of the wall along the Eastwall Road to allow people to come in and, and circulate around the Maritime Garden. And then last year, we launched the Pump House Heritage Zone, which is an area in the centre of the old shipbuilding part of the port in an area called the Alexander Basin Redevelopment Area, or T4. We've created a sliver of land that preserves the industrial heritage of the central port and links back through uh, the brand new bridge that you've seen as you were coming in back into to Port Centre. Uh, next year, we'll be opening up the Red Brook, uh, Red Brick substation, which is a, a protected building outside Port Centre here on the left-hand side, um, and uh, adding on a new glass building to its side. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea of what it's underneath. Uh, when we were looking at the foundations, we came across the original East Wall. So the reason why East Wall Road is called East Wall Road is because it was an East Wall. Uh, it was the furthest part of the, of the, the city built in 1720. Um, and we've been lucky enough to find um, this wall. This gives you a better image of what the, the area would have looked like in the 1720s and 1730s. Um, the area from the Custom House down to here was, was uh, filled in, first of all, by building a polder or a wall around this area. Uh, and then the land in between was leased to, uh, to renters who were there and obliged to fill in the land and develop it for themselves. That happened throughout the 1700s. Uh, and recently, you may have seen it on the news, we, we kind of brought uh, RTE and news to kind of see what we discovered in the, uh, the foundations of the, the substation. So next year, we're going to uh, open the building, probably in May, um, and this will have a, a, gra a glass uh, floor, which will allow you to see the original 1720s wall uh, in, the, uh, in the basement. And finally, then, we have a, a new cultural area in the port, uh, which is based around the uh, Odlums uh, factory, uh, which closed down about 10 years ago. Uh, and this is a project that we developed in 2019 with uh, the architects, uh, Grafton Architects. Um, and they've uh, developed an area uh, of kind of a uh, cultural quarter with museums, uh, archive buildings, and other kind of tourist attractions right center of the port with some great views uh, looking down uh, and to kind of see the active port, uh, which uh, we're developing at the moment. So that just kind of gives you a quick uh, look at what we've done over the last couple of years, five years in relation to the decade of commemorations. Um, as I said, most of the material I've talked about here you'll find on our website. Um, and if you have any queries, please do email myself or my colleague Marta uh, if you have any questions. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope you found uh, today's seminar fascinating. Thank you.